morning, everyone. Good morning. Great to see you all here today. Very special welcome to our guests. It's our prayer that no one leaves the service wishing they spent their time elsewhere. Today's scripture is taken from the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 3, verses 13 through 21, and it reads like this. No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever who does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light, and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. Again, good morning, guys. Good morning. It's a handful of us here today, but I'm sure happy to see you all. And we're here to worship him today. So, um, it's up there on the screen. For God so loved the world. John 3.16. John 3.16 is one of those verses that um, we see in, in sports uh, uh, games, right? Sometimes uh, even some of the athletes. I know there used to be Tim Tebow used to have it under his eyes. Uh, John 3.16. Um, there are some businesses. I don't know how many of you in the East Coast have ever heard of In-N-Out Burger. They're very popular in the West. And in the bottom of their drinking cups, right on that little lip in the bottom, they have John 3.16 printed on there. You know, there's another, I, I forgot which store it is, that has on their shopping bags, John 3.16 in the bottom of it. And I also remember as a child... Um, sitting around the table and my mother teaching me Bible verses and teaching me John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You could go back a couple to the beginning of that again. <laughs> Shift. There you go. You got it. So I want everybody to repeat that with me today. OK, as, is, as you see it up there, repeat that with me. Um, we start with with so God. So for God so loved the world. If you could get that one frame up there, the beginning of, of John 3, 16. There you go. OK, everybody read that with me. Ready? Here we go. One, two, three. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him, not perish, but have eternal life. And so she would teach me those verses and, and this particular verse. I mean, this particular verse always rang out. In, even when I was living my life of disobedience to God and running the streets of New York with street gangs, this verse was always in the back of my mind. But then um, it took me a while to understand that even though it's good to know these Bible verses, and even though it's good to know this and memorize it, it has no effect, no benefit if I don't apply them to my life. It's like, you know, we know diet and exercise will help you get you into shape, right? I mean, we do know that, right? Diet and exercise, but how many of us do it? Right? We, 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 oh, excuse me. 
right? We know diet and exercise will work if we do it. And so it took me a while in my life to learn that this John 3.16, that for God so loved the world, would have a benefit for me if I did it, if I applied it, if I applied it to my own life. And so um, the gospel is uh, all encompassed in this verse. Some have called this um, the gospel in miniature. It's the whole Bible in one verse. The story of God's love for his creation that he has made a way to have relationship with that that he made. Now we have to go back, right? We have to go back to understand this. We have to go back to God's first creation of man, man and woman. God created man and woman. He told them, celebrate life, have a ball, but just don't do this one thing. You see, so many times, right, like in Sunday school class, we teach that, oh, they ate the apple. That was bad. And it's not about eating the fruit. It was about doing what God said not to do. That's where the whole problem began. And so from that moment, since we read in Scripture that God is a holy God and God cannot be where there is sin, there was a separation created between man and God. We lost the intimacy we had, we had with God. And in losing the intimacy with God, we also lost the benefit of walking with God. But God did not abandon his creation. You see, when the verse talks about God so loved the world, it's not the world that he's just talking about. It's talking about his creation of the world. You and I, people, he loved us so much that he wanted to restore what had been lost in the garden. And so since the beginning of time, God has had this plan that he himself would come in the form of a man. It reminds me of the story of a man who was trying to save a hive or, or, or a den of ants from crawling over the edge and dying. And he tried all kinds of things. He would put barriers and they would climb over the barrier and, and go to their death. And he tried all kinds of things. Now, remember, this is just a story until eventually he came up with the idea. I'll become an ant. I'll go down there and I'll tell him about the danger. Now, needless to say, many ants still kept falling over the cliff. But that's the story in, in, in a nutshell of what God had done for us. The creator God became man. That's what we celebrate at Christmas time, right? He was born in a manger. And what was his name? Emmanuel. And what does Emmanuel mean? What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. And so he came down in the form of a human, proved his power and deity in the miracles that he did in his life, and then was betrayed and killed. And I said, wait a second, wait a second, this is God. What do you mean they killed him? Well, if we keep on reading in that Bible, the Bible tells us that, that the only way that, that the gap between God and, and humans can be brought back together was through the punishment of death. All have sinned, the Bible says, and the wages of sin is death. And so when we read in Isaiah that he says, that the punishment that we deserved was upon him. He was bruised, beaten. This was a voluntary thing he allowed to happen 
He was bruised for our iniquities. And that even ends with the idea that by his stripes, we are healed. We are made whole. This is the promise. And so when Jesus came, the Roman soldiers, after he was falsely accused, grabbed Jesus and with a cat of nine tails, punished him by putting stripes, marks on his back. And then the Romans grabbed him and crucified him. Listen, the Romans were experts on how to make somebody die very slowly and painful. I mean, they would hang on the cross for days, dehydrated. It would be the living dead, literally. With ravens picking their eyes. Horrible. And yet Jesus went through that so that we can now have this relationship with God. That's how important that relationship with God is to him. That God sent his only son. Now the verse says, for God so loved the world. And for many people, that's the barrier we got to pass at first. For God. They can't get past the idea. That there's a God. We've been studying in our Sunday school class how, how, how the idea of, of resisting or denying God is really an idea of trying to say, I don't want any higher power over me. I don't want anyone saying how I should live my life. So I'm just going to deny the existence of a God. And so we see that, that the, it starts with, for, for, right? for God so loved the world, for God. For God, we got to get past that barrier. Once we get past that barrier, then we can see how the rest of it has benefits and also has consequences. That he gave his one and only son, which I just spoke about on the cross. But Jesus just didn't die. He rose from the dead, didn't he? That's what we believe as Christians. He was buried three days and he rose from the dead. As he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven. As he ascended into heaven, an angel said the same way he came he went into heaven. He's coming back again. So we have this, this dynamic of Jesus dying, coming back to life, going into heaven, and then coming back again. For what? To fulfill that part of that verse. For God so loved his creation, the world, that he gave, right, on the cross, his one and only son, Jesus now, I don't know about you, but if somebody says, hey, your son has to die so everybody in the, in, the, in the world could live. How many of you are willing to do that? If you say yes, you're a liar. Right? We wouldn't do that. But that's how important God's relationship with you is. That he paid the ultimate price of giving his son for you. So that you can have a relationship with him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whosoever, some verses say, right? Whosoever. So who does that leave out? Who does that leave out? No one. No one. So that whosoever does what? Believes. Believes. Now, now in, in the Greek, belief and faith are synonymous with each other. Belief and faith are synonymous with each other. And in Scripture, we're told in James and in 1 John, that faith without action is dead. So our belief... Our faith has to have an action to it, right? Remember the diet and exercise? Right? If there's no action behind there, it doesn't help you. So to know these things without putting your faith and your belief into motion, into action, doesn't benefit you. So that whosoever believes should not walk. Should not what? 
perish. Be destroyed. The word perish comes, uh, the root meaning of the word perish is total annihilation. The scriptures refer to perish in other words. It uses the word separation. It uses the word punishment. It uses the word judgment. It uses the word hell. If we choose to be separated from God now, then when we leave this life, we will be eternally separated from God then. It's just a choice that we make. He gives us the choice. Should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. This is where we get to the part of Jesus doing what? Coming back. Everlasting life. The promise of eternity with God, with our Creator. No longer the barrier of human bodies and temptations and sins, but being with God eternally. This is His promise. This is His word. And as far as I know, Jesus has kept everything He's ever promised to this point. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. How many of you want everlasting life? That starts now, guys. That doesn't start when you die. That's the devil's lie. Everlasting life starts now when we go back to that relationship with the Father, through Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us. He loved us so. He did these things. Out of what? Out of love. His motivation was love. Now, the Greek word is agape. And, and agape is, is a lot stronger than the word we use for love. Because, I mean, you know, I love my car, right, we would say. But do you refer to your car like you did to your daughter or your son? It's a different kind of love, isn't it? But you still use that one word, love. But in the Greek, agape is a different kind of love. It's a love that doesn't end. It's a love that doesn't give up. It's a love that's always there for you when you turn to it. And that's what we're getting to. Turning back to God's love. Another word the Bible uses for turning back is an old-fashioned word called repent. When we ask God for forgiveness, then that's the diet and exercise for this John 3.16 to be useful in our lives. When we turn back, when we repent, when we give our hearts Back to Jesus. Jesus, I was born. You gave me this life. I give it back to you. That means the way I live my life is going, be, going to be the way you want me to live it. So, this is the gospel, as people say, in a nutshell. So, if you would like to commit your life to Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you want eternal life, if you just don't want to play the game, but you want to be the winner of it, then I invite you today to give your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you would like that, then I would ask that you would repeat with me this prayer. Let's all close our eyes. As we come before God, would you repeat with me this prayer? Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for me. I believe you died for my sin. I believe you rose from the dead and I turn from my sins and I invite you to come into my heart and my life. 
Let's say that again. And I invite you to come into my heart and my life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. If you've prayed that prayer with me today, sincerely, then you're starting a new life. Even today, you're starting a new walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Apply the scripture to your life so it could be powerful and living in you. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for those that repeated this prayer this very moment, Father, come into their hearts and lives. Guide them in what they say and do. Let them love you. Let them know your love in such a way that they want to love you the way you love them. That they would love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that they would love others as themselves. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.